Welcome viewers. Topic of today's discussion is bacteria, their discovery, characteristics and cell structure. Bacteria, they are present almost everywhere. Estimated that out of 50 billion galaxies, we do have 10 to the power of 21 stars in the visible universe. But if we peep into the microbial universe, we will realize that we do have 10 to the power of 31 microorganisms which are scattered in an estimated 2 to 3 billion species. Out of them, 40 billion bacteria we will find in just 1 gram of dirt and 1 million of them are staying just in 1 ml of water. Human body has almost 10x amount of more bacterial cells than the human cells present in them. They have been evolving from almost 3.5 billion years. That's a lot of time to turn into different species. If we look into the appearance of life on Earth, we will find that almost prokaryotes have evolved 3.5 billion years ago. But the story was into darkness until and unless we got contributions from large number of scientists who have contributed immensely in understanding the subject of microbiology or bacteriology. First, I must acknowledge the contribution of Robert Hooke, who produced compound microscope in the year 1665. He built a compound microscope and used to observe thin slices of cork and coined the term cell. Next come the contribution of Anton von Leeuwenhoek in the year 1675 on September 17th he first observed live microorganisms and named them animacules means tiny creatures tiny animals using his single lens microscope that was designed by him later on there was a conflict between spontaneous generation of life and germ theory of life which was being solved by the discovery of Francisco Reddy he said the theory of biogenesis and said that living cells can only arise from other living cells. In 1668, he proved that maggots do not arise spontaneously from decaying meat. Later on, Lazaro Spallengeni in 1765 found that nutrient broth that had been heated in a sealed flask would not become contaminated with microbes. And finally, the final stroke was done by Louis Pasteur in the year 1861, where he finally disproved spontaneous generation and he demonstrated that microorganisms in the environment were responsible for microbial growth in nutrient broth. The germ theory was being further enhanced by the discovery of Robert Koch, who first developed the relationship between microorganisms and the disease that they caused. He gave molecular postulates for testing relationship between disease and microorganisms. He was also famous as he discovered the cause of anthrax and tuberculosis. So if we come to bacteria, they constitute a large domain of prokaryotic microorganisms. Prokaryote means before nucleus. They are the smallest, simplest and oldest cells on earth. They are 1 to 5 micrometer long. If I compare them with eukaryotes, which are almost 10 to 100 micrometer long. The Six Kingdom classification states that Carl Woods was proposed a Six Kingdom system that includes two prokaryotic kingdoms, namely eubacteria and archaebacteria, and four eukaryotic kingdoms, namely planti, animalia, fungi, and protista. This Six Kingdom were then narrowed down into three domains of life, namely eubacteria, archaebacteria, and eukarya. Now, we can see that the three major domains as bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Though today we will be talking about bacteria, but before getting into details of bacteria, we must highlight a bit on archaea. So let's have a look that archaebacteria can be divided into three important major categories called methanogens, thermoacidophiles and extreme halophiles. Methanogens are those which are capable of growing in absence of oxygen and they are working on H2 and carbon dioxide to produce methane. 
On the other hand, thermoacidophiles are capable of growing in extreme environments of higher temperature. On the other hand, they can also grow in high pH, very low pH conditions of pH 2. And extreme halophiles which are capable of growing in great salt lakes and Uta Lake where the salt concentration is pretty high. Now we are coming to eubacteria, the category on which we will be focusing mostly in our lecture. Eubacteria are known as true bacteria, are prokaryotes and they lack nucleus. They are found almost everywhere and they kill thousands of people each year. They can produce antibiotics and they can produce food digesters in our stomachs. They are used to produce drugs, production of wine and cheese. They contribute immensely in industrial microbiology. But they lack mitochondria and chloroplasts, which are the features of eukaryotes. What they do have? They have got rigid cell wall, which is made up of peptidoglycan. They do have flagella, a cell membrane, which is composed of phospholipid bilayer. Apart from this, many of them are capable of forming spores that make them resistant to dehydration and most high temperatures. When there is no food, they are capable of surviving till 50 years. So let's look into in broader aspects of eubacteria. Mostly, they exist in three different structures. One of them is called as coccus, which are basically sphere-shaped. An example is streptococcus. Another morphology is bacilli, means they are rod-shaped. Example, lactobacillus. Third one is spirillum, means spiral-shaped. Example, spirillum. This eubacteria can be broadly divided into five phylum, namely spirochetes, chlamydia, gram-positive bacteria, cyanobacteria, and proteobacteria. Spirochetes, they are distinctive diderm bacteria which are long, helically coiled, chemoheterotrophic, gram-negative human pathogens. They are special in because they have got axial filaments or they do have got endoflagella. They are responsible for causing diseases like leptospirosis, Lyme disease, and trypanometosis. And the organisms in this category are Leptospira, Borrelia burgdorferi, and Tryponema pallidum. Next come Chlamydia. Chlamydia is a genus of bacteria that are obligate intracellular parasites. They are gram-negative, aerobic, non-motile, non-spores forming, and they cannot be seen under light microscope. They can only be cultivated only within the living cells. Chlamydia is a genus of pathogenic bacteria that are obligate intracellular parasites. Species include Chlamydia trachomatis. Next come is the gram-positive bacteria. They can be divided further into two categories, namely Firmicutes and Actinobacteria. Let's talk about Firmicutes. Firmicutes means firm, strong, and cutie means skin it is a clade consisting of many species that are gram positive. Most of them are low GC content. Genera includes Bacillus and Clostridium, Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. They are responsible for several mild to life threatening human diseases. Within the Firmicute is the genus Mycoplasma, which lacks a cell wall. Possibly, it is the smallest bacterial cell. Actinobacteria. Within the phylum are Actinomycetes. These are high GC-rich content gram-positive bacteria. These bacterial organisms form a system of branched filaments that somehow resemble the growth of fungi. The genus Streptomyces is the source for important antibiotics. Another medically important genus is Mycobacterium. One species of which Mycobacterium tuberculosis is responsible for causing tuberculosis. Another one, Mycobacterium leprae, which is responsible for causing leprosy. Next category is proteobacteria. Proteo means first. It means they emerge first. Major phylum of gram-negative bacteria. They include wide variety of pathogenic genera such as Escherichia, Salmonella, Vibrio, 
Helicobacter, Yersinia, and many others. Others are free-living, non-parasitic, and include many of the bacteria responsible for nitrogen fixation. It is likely that the mitochondria of the eukarya was derived through endosymbiosis from an ancestor of proteobacteria. It includes Rickettacea, which is barely seen with the most powerful light microscope. They can be cultivated only in the living tissues such as fertilized eggs. This proteobacteria can be further subdivided as alpha proteobacteria, beta proteobacteria, gamma proteobacteria, delta bacterial bacteria, epsilon proteobacteria, and zeta proteobacteria. Now we are coming to cyanobacteria. They are known as blue-green algae. They produce different colors of pigments ranging from black, yellow, green, or red. They are capable of carrying on photosynthesis and similar to unicellular algae using the light-trapping pigment chlorophyll. Evolution on Earth was responsible for the oxygen revolution that transformed life on the young planet. Chloroplasts probably are derived from the endosymbiotic union with a cyanobacterial ancestor. Often they occur in the filamentous form. Many species can incorporate or fix atmospheric nitrogen into organic compounds which are useful for plants. Now we are coming to another mode of classification where eubacteria were further divided into different categories on the methods of nutrition acquisition. Photoautotrophs, chemoautotrophs, photoheterotrophs, and chemoheterotrophs. Photoautotrophs are using light as their energy source and carbon dioxide as their carbon source. Chemoautotrophs are using inorganic compounds as their energy source and carbon dioxide as carbon source. On the other hand, photoheterotrophs are using light as their energy source and organic compounds as their carbon source. Chemoheterotrophs are using organic chemicals as their energy source and organic compounds as their carbon source. Next, we are coming to the classification system of bacteria. We do broadly classify them according to their phenotypic classification system and genotypic classification system. Among the phenotypic classification system, the system that won the hearts of all the scientific community was the Gram staining method that was being developed by Hans Christian Gram in the year 1884. He allowed large proportion of clinically relevant bacteria and classified them as Gram positive and Gram negative on the basis of differences in their cell wall characteristics. Gram positive ones were those having thick peptidoglycan layer and gram-negative ones were having thin peptidoglycan layer. As because gram-positives were having thick peptidoglycan layer, they retained the first stain and they were appearing purple in color. On the other hand, having thin peptidoglycan layer lost the primary stain and took up the secondary strain called the safranin and appeared to be pink in color. As you can see here in the slides that the gram positive ones which are taking the crystal violet color because of the fixation with iodine, the decolorization couldn't be done with the alcohol. On the other hand, the gram negative ones where the peptidoglycan layer was thin, it lost the primary stain that is the crystal violet on treatment with alcohol and it has taken the secondary strain safranin as a result of which it appeared red. Next, they can again be classified on the basis of their growth requirements. They can be facultatively anaerobic bacteria. It means they are happy in presence of oxygen as well as they can grow in absence of oxygen. They are really the tough one organisms like Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus, Escherichia and Salmonella. On the other hand, strictly anaerobic bacteria in this category, we do have got bacteroids. They are only capable of growing in minimal amount of oxygen. Oxygen was a poison for them. On the other hand, strict aerobic bacteria can grow only in presence of significant amount of oxygen like Pseudomonas aeruginosa. These are the opportunistic pathogens. Next, we are coming to 
micro aerophilic bacteria they can grow under conditions of reduced oxygen and sometimes they require increased level of carbon dioxide for their growth among them most prominent is nisharia next we are coming to the other methods of classification wherein biochemical reactions were performed by growing the bacteria in different media and depending on the results of this biochemical tests the bacteria was classified into different groups and finally serological systems were also used wherein we used antisera against proteins and carbohydrates which are specific for a particular bacteria so these are the different parameters on which phenotypic classification of bacteria was done next we would like to focus on genotypic classification system wherein universal phylogenetic tree which were prepared on the basis of 16s ribosomal rna sequences which are tremendously conserved so these sequences were used to categorize or catalog the bacteria and molecular subtyping is the final method wherein if i want to distinguish between different species belonging to the same genus we need to isolate the genomic dna carry on the restriction enzyme digestion of the genomic dna and separation of those fragments by pulse field gel electrophoresis next all this classifications were done using phenotypic methods genotypic methods and all other methods and this cataloging was finally being done by david hedrick burgess he first published this burgess manual of determinative bacteriology in the year 1923 this manual is basically a bible for all the microbiologists because anyone who is working on new bacteria and wants to identify them or catalog them he needs to refer this manual now we will be discussing on prokaryotic cell structure prokaryotic or organisms exhibit a highly ordered intracellular organization the motto of this organization is to sense the environment and to respond according to the changes in the exterior environment number 2 compartmentalization of metabolism number 3 to carry on growth and reproduction now we start with external prokaryotic cell structure the starting point will be pili pili is are protein fibers extending from the surface of the prokaryotic or bacterial cells structure wise they are numerous thin proteinaceous fibers and made up of proteins onto which specific adhesive molecules called adhesins are attached function of pili is to attach onto the surface where the bacteria wants to colonize it means it helps the bacteria to form biofilms it helps the bacteria to infect on the cells on which it wants to carry on its infection process apart from the pili we do have got certain bacteria which are capable of participating in horizontal gene transfer by means of conjugation this bacteria produce a special kind of pili which is called as conjugation pili that helps the bacteria to bring another bacteria in contact with and it helps to transfer the plasmid from the donor bacteria to the recipient bacteria so we can summarize that pili can be of two types one is utilized for colonization or forming biofilms and special kind that is conjugation pili is used for horizontal gene transfer of plasmids next external structure is called flagella flagella are long appendages extending from the cell surface of the bacteria as you can see here that it comprises of helical filament hook and a basal body and it has got a size of 10 micrometer to 20 micrometer it means it is almost 4 to 5 times longer than the size of the bacteria itself so let's have a look that what is the motto of this prokaryotic flagella it provides locomotion to the bacteria bacteria shows two kinds of motility one is called as flagellar motility and another is called gliding motility now you can see here that gram positive and gram negative bacteria do have minor differences in their flagella structures next external structure 
that hits our mind is glycocalyx. It is an outer layer external to the cell wall. It may be thick and it may be thin. When it is thick, it is called as capsule and when it is thinner, we call it as a slime layer. They are made up of diffuse polysaccharides. Most prokaryotic cells secrete an adhering layer of polysaccharides and small proteins called glycocalyx. Glyco means sweet and calyx means coat. So the function of glycocalyx is to protect the bacteria against desiccation and helps it to attach to the cell surfaces and helps the pathogenic bacteria to evade the immune response. Means production of glycocalyx is a methodology by which bacteria or pathogen are evading our immune response. The actual capsule can be seen by light microscopy while observing a negative stain preparation by transmission electron microscopy. Glycocalyx serves as a buffer between the cell and the external environment. Because of high water content, the glycocalyx can protect cells from desiccation. Next external structure of prokaryotic cell is the cell wall. It's the tough and the protective external shell. The bacterial cell wall comprises of peptidoglycan, which consists of chains of N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylmuraminic acid. Means these are the glycan strands. And this carbohydrate backbone is being cross-linked by the four amino acids or peptide cross bridges. So bacterial cell wall basically helps the bacteria to maintain the cell shape and to prevent the cell from rupture. Gram positive and gram negatives have got differences in their cell wall structures. As you can see that gram positives have got a thick peptidoglycan layer. On the other hand, the gram negatives have got thin peptidoglycan layer, but in addition to the peptidoglycan, they do have got outer membrane layer. Next, we are coming to the cell membrane. Where does it lie? It just lies beneath the cell wall. Bacterial membrane is composed of 40% of phospholipids and 60% of proteins. The phospholipids are amphiphilic molecules with polar hydrophilic glycerol heads attached via ester bond to two non-polar hydrophobic fatty acid tails, which naturally forms a bilayer in aqueous environment. Function of the membrane is it is an interface between the cell environment and cell cytoplasm. It gives selective permeability to certain compounds that regulates the passage of substances into and out of the cell. It allows the passage of water and uncharged molecules up to a molecular weight of 100 Daltons, but doesn't allow passage of larger molecules and charged substances, except by means of special membrane transport processes and transport systems. Now, after completing the external structures of the cell, we are coming on to the internal structure. The first one is the nucleoid. Nucleoid is the space within a prokaryotic cell where the genetic information called the genophore is formed. It is not having any membranes. It represents a central subcompartment where DNA aggregates. The nucleoid doesn't have uniform shape or specific size. However, we can distinguish it from the rest of the cell and identify it under a light microscope, mostly composed of multiple compacted copies of DNA in a continuous thread with the addition of some RNA and proteins. The DNA in prokaryotes is double-stranded and generally takes a circular shape. Bacteria do have got one copy of its genome. Essential for controlling the activity of the cell and reproduction it is the position where the transcription and replication of the DNA takes place. It also contains enzymes that help the replication process to take place and other functional and structural roles are being played by certain proteins and they assist the DNA in and facilitating the cell growth and regulating genetic material of the cell. You can see here the nucleoid is circular, double-stranded piece of DNA, not surrounded by a nuclear membrane. Next structure is the plasmids. Plasmids are extra-chromosomal DNA elements. These are circular molecules 
called as covalently closed circular DNA, which is capable of autonomous replication. They contain certain genes present in them that gives extra privilege to the bacteria to survive under adverse conditions. They may be called as resistant plasmids that help the bacteria to sustain in presence of antibiotics, heavy metals and other stressful compounds. So the main function is they can be used as vectors in industrial technologies that use genetic engineering. Although plasmids may not be essential for cellular growth, they provide a level of genetic flexibility. For example, some plasmids possesses genes of disease causing toxins and many carry genes for chemicals or antibiotic resistance. Next, we are coming to another subcompartment of prokaryotic cytoplasm that is the ribosomes. Location, there are hundreds and thousands of these spherical particles spreaded in the cell cytoplasm. This gives it a granular appearance when it is viewed in electron microscope. The relative size is determined by how fast they are settling down when they are centrifuged. They are measured in Swedberg unit and prokaryotic ribosome is indicated as 70S which can be further dissected as 30S ribosomal subunit and 50S ribosomal subunit. Along with it, it comprises of rRNA and proteins. Their main function is to convert genetic code into an amino acid sequence and to build protein polymers from amino acid monomers. Next, we are coming to inclusion bodies which are present in the cytoplasm. These are a variety of small bodies and they comprising of granules and vesicles. Granules are the compacted substances without a membrane covering. They are made up of glycogen and polyphosphates. On the other hand, vesicles are enclosed structures called vacuoles. Some aquatic photosynthetic bacteria and cyanobacteria have rigid gas field vacuoles that help them in floating at a certain level. Some magnetotactic bacteria, example aqueous spirillum magnetotactum stores magnetite that is ferric oxide. The presence of such magnetic inclusion enables the bacteria to respond to magnetic field. The another subcompartment is called cytoskeleton. Initially, people thought that cytoskeletons are the property of eukaryotes. But now it has been seen that prokaryotes do have counterparts of cytoskeletons present in them, especially bacteria like Bacillus and E. coli. The prokaryotic homologs have been found in most non-spherical cells where they form a helical network beneath the cell membrane to guide the proteins involved in cell wall formation. The homologs are also involved with chromosome segregation during cell division and magnetosome formation. As you can see here, the FTSZ rings and MREB proteins help a lot during the cell wall formation. That during cell division, proper positioning of the cell wall is done taking help of these cytoskeletal proteins. So let's summarize what we have learned in our today's lecture. We have gone through the milestones that helped us to discover and visualize the bacteria. We have studied the different methods of classifying the bacteria on the basis of their nutrients they use, on the basis of gram staining, on the basis of the media or the environment where they reside. After that, we have focused on the different organelles which are present inside the bacteria and the important roles being played by them and they help the bacteria to survive. So with this, we end our today's lecture. Thank you.